I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries Podcast. Now, today we are in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 32. Now, before we get into today's chapter, it's important to review, I believe, the Jewish festivals. Why? Well, because they all have their origins in the Passover, and today's chapter prophesies concerning another judgment upon Egypt. And the Passover was really God proving that he is God to the Egyptians and then judging them through plagues. Uh, You know, there's six annual Hebrew festivals, which the Lord commands for his people to observe. And collectively, if you put them all together in series, every single year, they portray what we call a messianic timeline, a timeline for the Messiah and the birth and the origin and the conclusion of the church. We find these festivals listed in order in Leviticus chapter 23, and here's what they are. Passover, first fruits, weeks, trumpets, the day of atonement, <clears throat> and tabernacles, right? Passover, first fruits, weeks, trumpets, the day of atonement, and the feast of tabernacles. Well, let's talk about them for a moment. First, we consider the Passover, which is the story of God's deliverance of his people from Egyptian bondage. And he literally passed over the sin of those who believed his word and sacrificed lambs. And then they uh, smeared the blood of the lamb over their doorposts. And then deliverance came in the middle of the night without time to even bake bread with leaven in it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, you say, how does that, what does that have to do with Jesus? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, the, Paul, uh, the apostle Paul told the church in Corinth, therefore purge out the old leaven, like he's using that symbolism for the church, that you may be a new lump, right? unleavened bread, since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Now, the Egyptian Passover was a symbol of a greater Passover to come. And, of course, this was fulfilled by Jesus. And when he passed, uh, when he was our Passover uh, sacrifice, uh, that happened on the day of Passover. So next on the annual Hebrew festival calendar is the festival of first fruits. <clears throat> it is a barley harvest festival where the first gleanings are offered to the Lord. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 through 23, Paul telling the church in Corinth, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, and even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. So the year Jesus was crucified, the festival of firstfruits was three days after Passover. So the Messiah, who is our Passover, and he was crucified on Passover, is also our first fruit of all who would resurrect from the dead. And when did he resurrect? Literally, as he was our Passover and it was on Passover, he also resurrected. He is our first fruit on the festival of first fruits. Next on the annual Hebrew festival calendar is what they call Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks. It is seven weeks after the Passover every year. What does it remember, the Feast of Weeks? Why? Why does God say, I want you to remember this every year? Seven weeks after the Passover, the people of Israel stood at the base of Mount Sinai, also known as Mount Horeb. And there the mountain burned with fire, the fire of God's presence, and there was smoke. Each man heard the word of the Lord, and in his own heart, spoken by the Lord's voice, the Holy Spirit. But the people rejected the Spirit's direct personal revelation of God's Word, freaked him out. And so they chose instead for Moses to speak with God. And then afterward, Moses went up to the mountain to receive a written copy of God's Word, written by the hand of the Lord on tablets of stone. 
But while Moses was away for 40 days, <clears throat> within that 40-day period, the people started to become anxious. Has anyone seen Moses? And having rejected a personal relationship with God through the Holy Spirit's revelation of God's Word, and now without God's spokesman, Moses, the people became unruly, right? They didn't, they didn't have a law. They defaulted to the way that they worshipped in Egypt. And then Aaron, <clears throat> Moses' brother, allowed the people to worship a golden calf. And what was the result? The result was the death of 3,000 men. Now, <clears throat> the Feast of Weeks being seven weeks after Passover, <clears throat> let's count the days. So seven days in a week. So seven days <clears throat> times seven weeks is 49 days. And then the next day makes 50 well, when they were translating the Old Testament into Greek, <clears throat> the Greek language, they didn't choose the Greek word for a week for the Festival of Weeks. They chose the number of days, 50 days. Well, in Greek, 50 days is Pentecost. So the day of Pentecost in the New Testament is the Festival of Weeks. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost had fully come, at the end of the seven right weeks, they were all in one accord and in one place, as God had told the Jewish people to be. <clears throat> Suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. <clears throat> one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So think of it. On the same day that commemorated the rejection of the Holy Spirit, which led to the death of 3,000 men, the Lord chose to offer the Holy Spirit again, <clears throat> and that led to 3,000 men believing the gospel, receiving salvation filled with the Holy Spirit, and baptized all in one day. So now those first three festivals on the Messianic timeline have become accomplished, and they were fulfilled through Jesus. So Jesus is our Passover, crucified on Passover. He's our first fruit, raised on first fruits. And then the Holy Spirit was given on the same day that commemorates the rejection of the Holy Spirit when the Lord gave the word to Israel. And they act <clears throat> in such a way on the Messianic timeline. And they were fulfilled on those exact days. And this began the church era. This is how the church began, Acts chapter 2. The spring festivals have all been fulfilled through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And then, just like any of their all harvest festivals in the Bible, so you've got, you know, uh, <clears throat> you have barley harvest, Passover, then I'm sorry, you've got wheat harvest, uh, uh, first fruits of the barley harvest, then you've got the wheat harvest, which goes down here into Shavuot. And then you've got a long, hot summer. If you're a farmer and you've planted in the spring and you've got a long, hot summer, you're really hoping that you get rain in the fall to push up those crops so that there'll be a big harvest. And that's really been the era that the church has been in. And now we're awaiting for the fulfillment of the final three festivals, <clears throat> the fall festivals at the end of the church era. And the next annual feast on the Hebrew calendar at the beginning of the fall is an in-gathering, a big harvest in-gathering, and it's called trumpets. When trumpets are sounded and the people of Israel are to assemble before the Lord, bringing the tithe of the fall harvest. It corresponds with the New Testament in-gathering or the rapture of the church. And I believe there will be a revival right before the rapture of the church, which will occur. And that's what Groundworks Ministries is really working toward, preparing laborers to go out into that harvest field. Jesus said that we should pray for such things. Matthew 5, verses 35 through 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, The harvest 
is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers in his harvest. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a great shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. You may have been taught that Jesus could come at any time because of the words of Jesus, as he said in Matthew 24, verses 36 through 42. But the day of the Lord and the hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be, just a wicked and godless generation. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. <clears throat> then the two men will be in the field, and one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore. For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But here's an interesting twist on the Feast of Trumpets in our generation. After the Roman destruction of Jerusalem, the Jewish religious leaders lost track of what the exact day was for observing the Feast of Trumpets. A dispute arose which led to a compromise, and then the Feast of Trumpets would be extended from one to two days. So we're not really sure which day, and we don't want to offend the Lord. So we'll observe it for two days. <clears throat> so therefore, if I were a betting man, simply because the messianic context of all the other festivals was completed on the days of those respective festivals, well, then I would place my bet that the rapture of the church would happen in the festival of trumpets. Jesus' words are still true, for no man could know the hour because nobody even knows the day because not even the Jewish community knows which day is the correct day. And what is the time zone, by the way, for that last trumpet? Nobody knows the hour. Will it be Israel time zone, or will it be the Baker Islands, which is actually the last time zone on the international date line? Next on the annual Hebrew festival calendar is the Day of Atonement in Hebrew Yom Kippur. When books are opened and the Lamb of uh, the Lamb's book of life comes out, and sin is judged. Revelation 20, verses 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. If anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So after trumpets, you have judgment. So after the rapture, you have judgment. And then lastly, there is the Jewish festival of Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. The Jewish people are commanded to build booths and to live in them, to remember how God dwelt with them, with his people, during 40 years of post-Exodus wilderness wandering. Tabernacles is the Jewish festival, by the way, that all believers will celebrate for all eternity. Heaven is a never-ending feast of tabernacles. Revelation 21, verses 2 through 4, Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Now, today's chapter 
Ezekiel 32, focuses on God's judgment of Egypt during Israel's period of Babylonian exile. God judged Egypt in the past for their harsh treatment of Israel and because of Egypt's rejection of his word. His word came through Pharaoh, <clears throat> sorry, came to Pharaoh through Moses, accompanied by miracles. God is saying through Ezekiel that he will once again judge Egypt, and for the very same reasons. The Hebrew feasts are all lessons learned from the Exodus in annual festival form. Israel, throughout their generations, are never to return to Egypt. But here today, we read of another Egyptian judgment and how some Judean exiles dreamt of how much greater that life would be in Egypt if we just went back. You may ask why the God of Israel spent so much time focusing on destroying Egypt. Because the Lord is God over all creation. He doesn't just uh, affix his interest on the church. Acts 17, verses 30 through 31, Paul speaking at Mars Hill to the entirely pagan audience there in Athens. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. <clears throat> now, Egypt in the Bible is more than a nation. It's also symbolic of a way of thinking. Egypt represents a type of rebellious refuge that God's people seek instead of trusting in the Lord and His Word. Egypt is also a symbol of a type of idolatry. It's a type of refuge. It's a type of idolatry. So by clinging to things you can see, <clears throat> one rejects living by faith in the God who is unseen. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Israel was not the only nation who sought refuge in Egypt, so Egypt's rejection of the Lord negatively affected the international community as well. The question arises then, what are you trusting in to give you peace amidst uncertain times? Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So surely we need more peace and joy, and less anxiety and uncertainty in our generation. Ezekiel told the Judean exiles that what feels like God's rejection is actually His grace and mercy toward them. In chapter 32, they are learning about how much worse that it would have been to have not trusted in the word of the Lord. So for the exiles who entertained the false belief that Egypt could have delivered Judah, just look, Egypt has fallen. People are like, oh, if we had only gone down to Egypt instead of going north and going into captivity. No. You were spared by not going to Egypt. Folks, no politician, either liberal or conservative, none of those ideals can make America great again. Only God can build a nation. And he only delights to bless a nation that worships him as almighty. Nobody can curse the nation whom God is determined to bless. And nobody can rescue the nation that God has determined to bring low. Our hope is not in our nation's constitution. Because the constitution is not inspired by God, it's not God-breathed scripture. Otherwise, the constitution would be canonized in the Bible. While there is clear evidence that the men who wrote the constitution were personally influenced by the Bible because it is comprised of the words of men instead of the promises of God, there's cracks in the Constitution. And therefore, there's cracks in its ability to protect and to preserve the nation. No, our only hope is found in God and His Word alone. 
Just look at America today. You know, it's amazing how one generation, far removed from the lessons of their forefathers, will repeat the same mistakes. My grandfather's generation fought socialism and fascism in World War II. My dad fought through the Cold War. And my generation saw the fall of Soviet socialist communism. And yet my children's generation <clears throat> embraces fra fascist and mob-like tactics as a justified means to establish a socialist society in America, which they believe is being held hostage by free market capitalism. Of course it's crazy. Satan doesn't have any new lies. He just has new generations who are rebellious against their parents. When you surrendered to the Lord and when you receive salvation, the Holy Spirit transforms you from a child of Adam born into sin to become a child of God born again into Christ's righteousness. John chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And as such, Jesus delivers you from the power of sin and death. He provides for and he protects you. And if you seek his word, taught by the Holy Spirit, and if you trust him day to day, well, then you will live continually within his blessing experiencing his faithfulness daily. And yet even God's children, <clears throat> as we're learning about in Ezekiel, even God's children can rebel against the God who delivered them. And while they may return to Egypt in their hearts, it's not as though they cease to be saved. God's children, who are saved by grace through faith, are always kept by his hand. We're not kept by our own hand. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Again, God's children, saved by grace, held in his hand, can choose to rebel and they can walk away from him in their hearts. All the while, they never fully understand they are walking away from his blessing. God is addressing this reality with Israel through Ezekiel. There is no place that a child of God can run where God is not sovereign. He is sovereign in Egypt and he is sovereign over Egypt. Meanwhile, for Israel, <clears throat> God's ongoing deliverance and provision are increasingly in short supply because of their rebellion. No matter how many times we play the Egypt card, we will never be dealt a winning hand against the Lord. Yahweh always trumps Egypt. Thank the Lord that he gives us the choice to return but whenever we do, we return with pain. So why not skip the pain and never stop drawing near to the Lord? And with that, all that said, if you're still wondering who to serve, well, let's consider Egypt's destruction. Let's read Ezekiel chapter 32, of course, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass in the twelfth year, in the twelfth month, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, You are like a young lion among the nations, and you are like a monster in the seas, bursting forth in your rivers, troubling the waters with your feet, and fouling the rivers. You're like a young lion. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He says in the first two verses, You're like monsters of the sea, bursting forth from the river. Most likely he's describing a crocodile. The Egyptians worshipped both the... Uh, both the uh, <clears throat> crocodile and the Nile River. 
Why? Well, because these creatures lived in the Nile, and the crocodile is ferocious, and he's powerful in his stealthiness. God is telling Egypt that while they may be a crocodile in their own eyes, crocodiles can still be caught by skilled hunters. And like a crocodile dragged far from the Nile River, they too will be helplessly dragged far away onto the dry land. You can't seek back under the water and hide and move away. And you're going to lose your power to burst forth and devour the nations on the shoreline. In turn, Egypt will be devoured by the nations because they're now out of their habitat. The nations they used to terrorize will eat them symbolized by the birds and the beasts of the whole earth, feeding upon them. Let's keep reading in Ezekiel chapter 20, uh, 32, verse 3. Thus says the Lord God, I will therefore spread my net over you with a company of many people, and they will draw you up in my net, and then I will leave you on the land, and I will cast you out on the open fields, and cause to settle on you all the birds of the heavens. And with you I will fill the beasts of the whole earth. I will lay your flesh on the mountains and fill the valleys uh, with your carcass. And I will also water the land with the flow of your blood, even to the mountains, and the riverbeds will be full of you. I will water the whole land with the flow of your blood. You remember, <clears throat> you remember how uh, you remember how. Um, let me pull this back here. Uh, you remember how Moses oversaw the turning of the Nile to blood. It was payback for Pharaoh having turned the Nile to blood with the massacre of Israelite babies. And the fact that Moses stood before Pharaoh as an adult was a testimony that God had the power and the means to deliver Hebrews. He delivered Moses. And so the imagery is rich here because Egypt worshipped the Nile River as a god. <clears throat> they worshipped crocodiles. Pharaoh's drowning of Israelite babies in the Nile was also a sick form of worship, an offering of sorts to the Nile itself a human sacrifice to the Nile. Recall how God delivered Noah <clears throat> and his family from drowning in the great flood and how God commanded Noah to build an ark. Well, Moses was also saved from drowning in the Nile River in an ark of sorts. It was a basket made of reeds. And when God delivered Israel from Egyptian bondage, he demonstrated his power to miraculously save them from drowning in the Red Sea. Think of it. What color is blood? You see, then that same God caused the Egyptians to drown in that same sea, which had provided deliverance for Israel. Again, payback for the blood of the innocent Israelite babies came by the way of a sea called red. No doubt, Egyptian public schools taught an anti-Semitic version of that history lesson. Now, Ezekiel prophesies the Nile will once again turn to blood. But this time, it won't be Hebrew blood. It'll be Egyptian blood. Let's keep reading in Ezekiel chapter <clears throat> uh, 32, verse 7. Ezekiel 32, verse 7. He says this, When I put out your light, I will cover the heavens, and I will make the stars dark. I will cover the sun with the cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. <clears throat> Verse 8, And the bright lights of the heavens I will make dark over you, and break darkness upon your land, says the Lord God. So the Passover happened <clears throat> at night, when in the middle of the night it was discovered that all Egypt's firstborn were dead. Then Pharaoh commanded the Israelites to leave immediately. Now Ezekiel is prophesying that once again Egypt's sin will not be passed over, for the same reason as during the days of the Israelite exodus. Egypt rejected the word of the Lord, and they chose rather to rebel instead of repent and worship God and be saved. 
Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 9. I will also trouble the hearts of many peoples when I bring your destruction among the nations into the countries which you have not known. Israel was exiled from Egypt, literally deported by Pharaoh in Moses' day. Pharaoh literally said, get out. But the Israelites were exiles with hope. <clears throat> Notice, they were hope. Why? Because they were headed toward a promised land. Ezekiel is prophesying that when Egypt is exiled, they will be exiled without hope. Furthermore, all the nations who put their trust in Egypt become collateral damage to God's judgment. Let's keep reading in Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 10. Yes, I will make many peoples astonished at you, and their kings shall be horribly afraid of you. When I brandish my sword before them, and they shall tremble every moment, every man for his own life in the day of your fall. For thus says the Lord God, the sword of the king of Babylon shall come upon you. And by the swords of the mighty warriors, all of them, the most terrible of the nations, I will cause your multitude to fall. And they shall plunder the pomp of Egypt, and all of its multitude shall be destroyed. I will also destroy all of its animals from beside the great waters. The foot of man shall muddy them no more, nor shall the hooves of animals muddy them. I am killing animals as well as killing all the people. <clears throat> Nothing will muddy the shores. Now, consider this. Exodus 12, verses 12 and 13. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night. This is the Passover. It's more like a pass through. <clears throat> and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Once again, this is what God says, I'm going to do it again. Both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. You worship the Nile, judging the Nile. You worship crocodiles, judging crocodiles. You worship yourself, judging you. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Why? Because judgment's already happened here. Why? Because a lamb has been sacrificed for your sin. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So no longer just a judgment on the firstborn. The coming judgment will affect everyone and everything in Egypt. Let's continue reading. Ezekiel 32, verse 14. And then I will make their waters clear and make their rivers run like oil, says the Lord God. When I get, when I get finished with Egypt and their sin has been judged <clears throat> and the land is rid of them, then the waters will be clear. Nobody to mutter the waters. After sin is judged, <clears throat> after sin is judged, God has limits to his judgment. Okay, he will not judge forever, at least not at that time, right? He won't judge forever. Let's keep reading in Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 15. When I make the land of Egypt desolate and the country is destitute of all that once filled it, when I strike all who dwell in it, then they shall know that I am the Lord. This is the lamentation with which they shall lament her. The daughters of the nation shall lament her, and they shall lament for her, for Egypt, and for all the multitude, says the Lord God. Verse 17, And it <clears throat> came to pass also in the twelfth year, on the fifteenth day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, Wail over the multitude of Egypt and cast them down to the depths of the earth, her and the daughters of the famous nations, with those who go down to the pit. <clears throat> Whom do you surpass in beauty? Go down and be placed with the uncircumcised. That is, those who are disobedient to the word of the Lord. Acts chapter 7, verses 51 through 53. <clears throat> you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. <clears throat> Excuse me. I will always resist 
I'm sorry, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. <clears throat> Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you have now become betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of the angels <clears throat> and not kept it. It's one thing to have a Bible. It's another thing to read it. It's a whole other thing to actually obey it, <clears throat> commit it to your life, to be the rule of your life. We keep reading in verse 20. <clears throat> They shall fall in the midst of those slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword, drawing her in all of her multitudes. The strong among the mighty shall speak to him about the, uh, out of the midst of hell with those who help him. They have, come, they have gone down. They lie with the uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Assyria is there, <clears throat> and all of her company with their, their graves all around her, all of them slain, fallen by the sword. Her graves are set in the recesses of the pit, and her company is all around her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, who caused terror in the land of the living. There is Elam and all of her multitude, all around her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, who have gone down uncircumcised, <clears throat> without the Bible, to the lower parts of the earth, who caused their territory in the land of the living. <clears throat> now they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. They have set her bed in the midst of the slain, with all her multitude, with her graves all around it, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though their territory was caused in the land of the living. Yet they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit, hell, and it was put in the midst of the slain. <clears throat> there are Meshach and Tubal and their multitudes, all with their graves around it. All of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though they caused their terror in the land of the living. They do not lie with the mighty, who are fallen of the uncircumcised, who have gone down to hell with, with their weapons of war. Now it's no longer just Sheol, it's just flat out hell. They have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquities will be on their bones because of the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Yes, you shall be broken in the midst of the uncircumcised and lie with those slain by the sword. <clears throat> this is Edom, her kings and her princes, who despite their might are laid beside those slain by the sword. They shall lie with the uncircumcised and with those who go down to the pit. There are the princes of the north, all of them and all the Sidonians who have gone down the way of the slain in shame at the terror which they caused by their might, they lie uncircumcised with those slain by the sword and bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. <clears throat> Verse 31, Pharaoh will see them and be comforted over all of his multitude. Pharaoh and all his army slain by the sword, says the Lord God. For I have caused my terror in the land of the living, and he shall be placed in the midst of the uncircumcised, with those slain by the sword. Pharaoh, in all his multitude, says the Lord God. <clears throat> Pharaoh will see them and be comforted. Pharaoh will not be comforted because there's more Egypt Egyptians to party with in hell. You know, there's some people who believe, oh man, hell's going to be amazing because it's all the people that I like to party with. That's where they'll be. That's where I want to be. Hey, by the way, hell ain't a happy hour. Hell will be crowded with all your party friends, but hell is not a party. Hell is a torment. And the great shameful tragedy of hell is that you don't have to go there. You have a choice to believe the gospel, to surrender to it, and to receive salvation. Pharaoh will be comforted by knowing that God is holy and righteous when God judges. No generation of Egyptians will boast 
or complain that the God of Israel was more gracious or that his justice was more lenient toward any other generation of Egyptians who reject his offer of salvation. God is not more lenient on some generations and harder on others. God is the same throughout the generations, as is his word. Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 23. Repent, therefore, and be converted, be changed, that your sins may be blotted out. In the Revelation, the books are laid out, <clears throat> and those not in the book of life. Well, guess what? Your name's in a book right now. It's the book of life or it's some other book. But unless your name is blotted out from the one and written into the other, if you're not converted and your sins aren't blotted out, you'll be judged to the full extent. He says, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You know, the presence of the Lord is not refreshing for the uncircumcised, as it says here, those who don't live according to the gospel, the word of God. <clears throat> so repent that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of of all his holy prophets since the world began. That's what the prophets have been saying from the beginning. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from all of your brethren, and him you shall hear in all things. That is, you, you, you shall, you've got to hear him. You, tr you can't get to heaven any other way than whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who did not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 32. <clears throat> I have caused my terror. Literally, Babylon is not the one causing the terror. Babylon is the sword of judgment in the righteous right hand of the arm of the Lord. The God of grace and mercy is also the God of justice and wrath. And the Bible says he will by no means clear the guilty. And his coming wrath will make the flood of Noah <clears throat> and the fire and brimstone of Sodom and Gomorrah and the downfall of Babylon and Egypt. Well, he make all that look like warm-up acts in that final day of the Lord. Horror and terror follow the trumpet of his judgment. Glory and honor await all who will be caught up in the rapture at the sound of that last trumpet. So which trumpet will call you? Were it to sound today, the choice is yours. Do you want to experience the salvation of the Lord, or would you rather experience the judgment of the Lord? Because you could be forgiven. You could be washed from within. You could begin operating and the power of God's presence in your life. And I can lead you in a prayer where you don't have to think what, what I say. I'll just lead you in a prayer where you can talk to God yourself. It's just the gospel. And if you believe these things in your heart and you confess them with your mouth, the Bible says you shall be saved. You can confess your sin. You can profess your faith in Jesus, that he died on the cross for your sin, that he rose from the grave, that he's alive today offering salvation if you would believe and receive it. You can know for certain that you will go to heaven when you die and that the Holy Spirit will immediately rush into your life and begin guiding you as you seek his word, the Bible. And if you want that, it's yours for the taking right now. Let's pray. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. I know that you are perfect and holy, and I fall short of your standard. But I believe that Jesus is God made flesh. And as such, he is perfect and holy. And he died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. I believe he rose from the grave, proving that he has defeated sin and death. And he is alive today, offering to me 
forgiveness of all my sin, the Holy Spirit to guide me through life, heaven when I die, if I would believe it and receive it. So, Lord, I believe. I surrender control of my life to you, Lord. Come into my heart. Fill me with your presence, your Holy Spirit, and begin to teach me how to live a life of thankfulness and purpose, which you created for me when you imagined me in my mother's womb. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So you prayed that prayer, and you're like, okay, I prayed that prayer. What do I do now? Well, I'd love to hear from you. Number one, congratulations. Welcome to the family of God. But I'd love to hear from you. And you can, if you're watching on a on a, one of these, uh, like a real-life network, or if you're on YouTube or Vimeo or some other streaming place that has a comment section, you can comment right there. Hey, I just prayed to receive the Lord. What do I do next? And uh, <clears throat> we'll reach out to you. Uh, if you don't want to do that, then you can go to our website, and you can leave us a message there, groundworksministries.com, and then we'll reach back out to you. I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries podcast. Now, Groundworks Ministries operates entirely through financial donations from faithful people just like you. And yes, we need your monthly support. You know, donating is secure and it's easy at our website, groundworksministries.com. Another way to help is tell people about Groundworks Ministries. You can share these podcasts with friends and family and on your social media. And of course, you can always direct folks to our website, groundworksministries.com.